eventually happens is if Romans try to get across the Tigris, they fail. You know, the Germans, they swim across, they kill everybody, but there's no way to get everybody across. So they capitulate. Jovian makes a treaty with Shafur II, saves the army, kind of. He gives up Nespes, all of Mesopotamia, large parts of the Taurus Mountains, and they have a treaty that's going to last for about 20 years. Now, when you go back and look at the conclusions, and this is why we started the way we did, Julian's intelligence operation failed to locate the Persian Royal Army and whether or not it had, where it had winter, in the Tigris Rady Valley or the other side of the Zagros Mountains. He lost the reconnaissance battle on day two. So he marched out in March, and once he made contact with the Persians, he pretty much was blind after that. In the early stage, the Roman cavalry and their Persian um, uh, usurper were fighting, but they were losing every one of them, every one that's been recorded. Uh, this session was insufficient to supply his army. He actually started off with a good logistics system. He had a thousand boats carrying food and supplies. As you notice, he followed the river, so he had plenty of water at all times. So water was never a problem, but food would become a problem when he can't take the city. Uh, okay, here was a little critical factor that uh, Minas Marcellinus doesn't even notice. They lost the pontoon boat. This basically doomed the army. Because after the peace treaty, they still had to get back to Roman territory. The estimates are more died during that march without supplies across the desert for about two or three weeks to get back up into Roman territory than probably died in the entire deal. So you're starting with an army of 60,000 men that marched down there. And they, the estimates are when the smoke cleared, there was only 30,000 left. This is the offensive capability of the entire Roman army has now been reduced to 15,000, 30,000 men. That's me. Uh, some people think it's 15,000. Okay. Uh, Julian's religious policies basically subtracted the Armenian contingent of 20,000 men out of the equation. And again, failure to bind the Saracens or the Arabs created more of his problems than the intelligence kind of deal. So, shameless plug, everything I said is in this book. I wrote it, I get it a pound per. Second shameless plug comes out next year, Soviet cavalry operations during the Second World War, and then the third book will be back into where we were. So, questions? Did oh, that's that a shameless plug for three. <laughs> that's, you, did, uh, you did mention that there were three times that the Romans had taken Siesta Pond. Yeah. Yeah. So it was doable. Well, I mean, when were those three times? Because I know pri up until at least, you know, the mid... 193 it was taken. Oh, okay. Um, it was taken a second time in the 200s, and the third time I can't remember when. It's in, it's in that same time frame. Because uh, I know Mark Anthony Sept tried to take it, and he, you know, uh, yeah. he just botched yeah. it. Sept Septus Service took it. Uh, and again, I said there's two two other times, so it wasn't impossible for a no Roman army to get down there and do it. Wasn't Cadiz originally a Greek city established? Yeah, it's called Seleucus on the Tigris, yeah. and it is um, here. It is. And it also there's actually it was one city, and then the river jumped and cut it in half. You know, what's interesting to me is, is seeing the description, especially of the marching um, in the mm -hmm. square and how the Persians would hit you know, the back and create that gap. Uh, it, it's very tempting when you look at battles like this. You always think of it in terms of grand tactical. Mm -hmm. But it was actually a strategic operation, mm -hmm. which is just the way you would divide an entire national army on the frontiers of its country. Exactly. It was, it, was that, it was a tactical situation writ large. It was a strategic operation. In, in miniature. Right, and so you got to remember, we have an advantage today that they didn't have in the 1900s, when a lot of the, uh, the early writings were done, is we look at war as tactical, operational, and strategic. Right. Okay. The Romans looked at it the same way. They didn't call it that. But as Caesar, the others, they knew what operations was, which is logistics, uh, movement of troops, how long is it going to take you to get from point A to point B. Like, in this time, you think in seasons. Today, we think in hours. They think in seasons. So if something happens on the Danube and Andrianople, 
Something happens on the Danube, and the Royal Imperial Field Army is outside Antioch, and I'm Valens, the emperor, who's going to get killed in Antioch. I can't do anything about it right now. It's going to take two seasons to shift this army up. Yeah, I can march them up there in a short period of time, but there'll be no supplies. Right, you've got to coordinate with the harvest, right. you've got to coordinate with the weather, you've got to coordinate with the body. Right. Now, all that's left out of the accounts. All of it's left out of the accounts. What you find is he's over here at this particular time, and then just before the battle at Andrianople, the emperor and the field army is at the city of Andrianople. What happened in the six months in between? Well, we, all, we know what happened, but most people reading the account don't. They had to get the supplies in place so we could do a fast march from point A to point B. They didn't have to carry the supplies. He didn't have 30,000 men. He only had 15,000 because he couldn't feed them to get a fast march up there in a of time. So you go through the logistics piece that is normally left out of the historians, and all of a sudden, the reason Valens, Caesar, Julian, Constius II, Theodosius I are making these decisions are operational decisions supply, logistics, time, distance, estimates. These are all, they're doing them all, but it's not recorded that way, type thing. Yes, sir? Yeah, Drew, that the last battle where you said they attacked the rear guard, it uh -huh. reminds me of the Battle of Arsuf, uh -huh. uh, where they attack, where uh, Saladin attack, you know, attacks yeah. the rear guard. They have to stop. And then there's a gap between them and the left wing. Right. They come through there, and then all of a sudden they have, as they try to bring everybody back to, mm -hmm. to, to shore it up, then he attacks the center of the column. Right. The ideal field army is 25,000 men at this, at this time. Ideal. Even though you may have 300,000 soldiers in your army, the ideal field army is 25,000. Why? Because you can command and control it. Once you start getting about like 60,000 in Julian's case, when you get about 60,000, you're out of control. I mean, you can't control it on the field. From one place, once everybody starts moving, all the dust goes up, you can't see to control. You can't put the reserve line in. Local, that's why they divide up in left, right, and center, you know, with commanders who could make those tactical decisions on the spot because the emperor himself can't see it, can't influence, can't do anything about it. By the time he knows about it, the elephants are already into your supply train in the case of Julian's time. And you can see how he's running back and forth trying to control it. And four miles doesn't seem like much. It is at 120 degrees. And you're killing your horse just trying to get a point A to point B. And your, your best hope of getting there on foot as a man is still an hour. Yeah. And, and those are the parts, when you read an ancient battle or a medieval battle, even though they're much smaller, you have to keep that time distance factor of how do you tactically command when you had those limitations. You said something interesting that I'd, I'd like to touch on real sure. quick if you have the time. Um, you mentioned that you know, we think in terms of tactics, operations, strategy. Mm -hmm. The Romans did too, although they didn't call it that. Right. And things like all of their timing for going to a campaign they didn't mention things like seasons, just like we wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. mention fuel. Right. Because to us, fuel is a given. Right. To them, those things were given. But what, what interested me was you said we have an advantage that they did not have in the 1900s. Correct. How did that perception get lost? Was it because of the Grand Armée kind of concept? Or was it I maybe should have said fortress concept? It should have been 1800s. 18, okay. I mean, 1700s. 1700. Because How when Napoleon you? comes in, right. all those start coming back in except for operations. Now, he's doing the operations in his mind. In those days, they call it tactics, strategy, and grand strategy. So what they would call strategy, like uh, Jomini wrote, he's really talking about operations. He's not talking about strategy, but he uses the term strategy. Oh, okay. okay. I think he used the term grand tactics. Right. Our grand tactics is another term they okay. use. But the terminology affected their ability to, to do things. Now. Did Howe, coming over to uh, fight the American Revolution, think in these terms? Of course he did. You know, he had, he's putting 10,000 men in the field. He knows it's going to take so much food and everything else. It's got to be shifted in. Yeah, they thought in those terms, but they weren't as definable to the average person as they are today. In those days, you learned to be a general by on-the-job training and watching generals as a junior officer. Today, we have staff schools that teach all this in great detail. So like as the, 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 this 
antidote for today is when you become a major, which is 15 years as an officer, you are an expert in strategy, but you're a novice at operations. Because now you're actually starting to what wins wars, campaigns and things like that. That's what operation tactics. If, Al, if the Al-Qaeda guys got the hill and got the machine gun position, you know, they put them in the same way we do. Uh, at the little skirmish level, the squad platoon level, it wouldn't make any difference. They're fighting Germans, insurgents, Taliban, or whatever. The fight is going to unroll the same way. But when you get to operations, that's where we win the battle before that fight took place, type thing. And again, it's always there, but you had to learn it as on-job training. And the Romans had a really good on-job training system. Yeah. You know. Yes, sir. Um, I was going to tell a little story inside of Plato's Republic. It's uh, Socrates and Glaucon are walking down the road, and they're trying to discover where justice is in the community. And they are said, and Glauc or rather, Socrates says, "We've been so stupid, Glaucon. Justice is so invisible. Justice is so invisible. It's under our feet." We don't see it, mm -hmm. and that's the problem with operations. Is mm -hmm. When they write about these things, they assume, in a lot of cases, that you know that time frame of six months or, right. or seasons is preparations for the operation. Right. And they don't have to explain it to. It's like it's not like it's like one of these TV movies where they explain to you the uh, surgery or whatever. It is. They wouldn't do that normally. Right. They would assume that each person knows what they're talking about without having to explain it. Right. And that's why when we talk about the first thing was bias of the of the yeah, other person. Yeah. That's it's exactly because what you were saying and I'll give you the example. author take for granted that the reader knows. Right. And like yeah. Caesar, he's our best account of the Roman army. Right. Who's he writing for? He's writing for the senatorial class who are all generals. And they already know this stuff. Right. So the details that we would them. want, he leaves out because everybody knows how right. the lines change. Exactly. You know? Yes, sir. Yeah, just the last one. Sure. I think it, I think people did know, and they talk, but they talked about it in a very general way. The one, mm -hmm. one description is where, I think that when the Bible says, and David stayed home mm -hmm. when kings went to war. Right. So there was a, a period of time that people understood is when you war. Mm -hmm. And so it was something that was just, generally thought of and it was like oh we go to war in this period we go to, we stay home in this period but so people like i said did know right they just well they just didn't elucidate you know well the campaign season was in a certain period of time for a specific reason all those animals have to eat and it's a lot easier from the graze on the way than it is to carry the fodder with them julian blew it a couple times on logistics and it, it's mentioned by marcus marcellanus uh, he attacked into Germany before the crops were ripe. He had his guys leave 15 days of their food back because he was going to live off the land. He's an office general at this time. Guess what? Uh, they beat the Germans and there was no food because it was still green in the, in the field. Uh, so you'll see little errors in there from really good historians. Caesar, uh, Manus Marcellanus, some others, uh, Xenophon. Uh, when they talk about supply system, but supply systems are rarely mentioned in ancient sources because you're expect if you're literate enough to read this or be at a party where it's being read as entertainment, you already know that because it's an OJT system, on the job training system. You know, you would know that you got to do these things for horses. You got to know you got to do these things for supplies because otherwise you wouldn't be at the party. Yeah, if you're the merchant class, that's yeah. not what you're reading. Right. You're reading trade routes and, right. and winds and seasons. And that's not the kind of thing. So you're going to be reading a whole different language as right. well. Right. So what happens Romance is. Romance novels and history novels. Right. When you take that tradesman and make him a general, he fails. Yeah. That's the, like the Earl Stanley Gardner routine with the, uh, the, the person that's found guilty at the end because there's this last minute piece of evidence that nobody knows about. Right. Through the whole damn novel. And, it's, and that's because Gardner kept it hidden. Oh, yeah, like Christie was infamous for that. Too. Yeah, and the other thing too is that there's a whole lot of World War II histories, World War One histories, even modern histories, where they simply assume a whole lot of stuff that you're supposed to know. Well, and it's like, well, how come this was this was done in this manner because of fuel or ammunition, right, or the time of day or the season or whatever that whatever it was, mm -hmm. and it's simply left off. Yeah, well, for modern things, it's real easy to figure out. All you have to do is look at the rank of the author, okay? 
if they're like if they're a captain, uh, they should be talking about tactics and them catching bad guys and stuff like that. They don't have any clue about what we're talking about now, because the, the military school system doesn't teach them yet. And so, as a result, when you hear a captain, and I'm not picking on an individual person who's a, a congressman now, nice guy, nice young guy, he was in the civil affairs team, and he said, if they had done just this, we would have won this that, and the other. Well, from his perspective, he's right. He's right here at the bottom of everything. He has no idea what's happening at operational or strategic level and what his piece, what his activity, how does it affect the rest of it? He has no idea how it is. So I went to his lecture, enjoyed it, asked one or two questions, not trying to put him on the point, realized he didn't have that education, and just enjoyed his story about his activities. Any other questions? Thank you.